Today, we're going to talk again about abortion in America. This is part two. Last week, especially in this service, and that we have two services because our worship center is not very big. Uh, you guys know that at the end, I got uh, very passionate. You know, I, I look back at that, and I, I'm not going to say I'm sorry. Because here's why, y'all. We're dealing, we're dealing with people made in the image of God that are exactly the same size in their mother's womb that you, you were at that point in your mother's womb. And so last week, you'll remember that we, we talked about the significance of what's going on in our culture. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I'm convinced that within the next couple of weeks, probably, the outcome of Roe v. Wade and the Supreme Court decision is going to come out. And based on the leak, it looks like a good thing for those who are pro-life in regards to protecting the unborn. And that's going to be a good thing. But there's going to be some difficult things that happen in our culture. And so I wanted you to be aware of what's going on because what can happen is we have misinformation. We don't know what's going on. We don't know how we can really serve and care and speak truth and love. And we're going to, we're going to do that. Now, some people would say, Jackie, this is a very political issue and, and such. And I would say, you know, the Bible doesn't dodge political issues. Matter of fact, political issues many times are moral issues, and the Bible always speaks to moral issues. And this is one of those, so I don't apologize for that. I will tell you that today we're not going to look at a ton of Scripture, and typically, you know, we're teaching through Scripture. So, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll be back in 1 Corinthians, and we're going verse by verse through that. And so if you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you to get online and check out our stuff online. Of course, there are some other good teachers doing some other great things in other churches as well, but we're grateful to, to have that privilege. One of the things we talked about is this, is that biology and what the Bible says are not in two different camps, believe it or not. Biologists who look at the reality, as we talked about last week, they see that this is not a, this is when the, the sperm and egg come together, that's actually life. That's the beginning of of not just, it's not a cat, it's not a dog, it's not a camel, it's a what? It's a human. It's a, it's a human being, right? That's being created and, and right there in the mother's womb. Now, there's different stages that the human being is at in the creation process, just like there were different stages when you were in your mother's womb and you were just as valuable, you know, a few days out from your conception as you were right now. Biologists and the Bible don't disagree on this. And so one of the things I wanted to show you was the significance of what the Scripture says as Christians, that you and I need to be aware of what the Scriptures have to say. And what I'm convinced of is the, the Bible, the, the God's, God's Scriptures, and God's biology that He created, they're not mutually exclusive. They actually function together. So let me give you an example that I mentioned last week, just kind of covering some bases we covered last week, and then we'll get into some more of the meat today. Notice this, and in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, the difference is where the baby's located, and we'll talk about location in a second. So in Luke chapter 1, you've got John the Baptist, the baby John the Baptist, that's in his mother's womb when Elizabeth sees Mary and realizes that Mary is pregnant, and in the process, she says, hey, the baby leaped in my womb. Remember that? And the word for baby inside the womb, the Greek term that Luke uses, who, by the way, was a medical what? Doctor. The ter Greek term that, that Dr. Luke uses, when the baby is inside the womb, and then comparatively, when Jesus is outside the womb, when Jesus is born, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger, and they did. It's the same Greek term. So from the Scripture's perspective, what I would submit to you is that inside the womb and outside the womb, God sees this as a human being, a baby, inside the womb and outside the womb. So then we spend a little bit of time talking about, now, what's the Scripture say about repentance and forgiveness, and why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because there are people probably in the room, and, or there are people who you know, that are valuable to God, that matter, that are made in His image, that have marred His image in their life, like you and I have, with some sort of sin in our life, and there are people who have either been, they've either paid for, been a part of, or had an abortion. The good news, if that's your situation or a friend that you know, here's the good news. God can actually forgive Abortion, just like you can forgive any other sin. There are heavy consequences for different sins, right? Like lying might not carry the same, it doesn't typically carry the same consequence as assault on somebody or on murder on somebody, right? But what I showed you from Psalm chapter 51 is King David, who was responsible for two major sins. First, he was with a woman who was not his wife, who was married to somebody else, that's adultery. She got pregnant and then it, and tried to cover that pregnancy up. He made sure to get Uriah, the woman's husband, back in from battle to say, hey, spend some time with your wife, enjoy time with your wife, so he would think it's his baby. He wouldn't do that. Uriah was so committed to King David and his troops who were out fighting, he said, I am not going to enjoy the pleasures of my wife while my men are dying and while I'm here to protect you, king. What a loyal guy. And so David 
David said, that's really cool. What a loyal guy. And that's the end of the story, right? No, he sent him out to battle with his own death certificate that basically told the the ruler, the guy who was in charge of his troops there, told him, hey, everybody pull back, but don't tell Uriah about the special way that everybody else knows you pull back. So everybody retreats, but Uriah, he gets killed. Now David's not an adulterer. He's a what? Murderer. He's a murderer. He's killed a human being. He's a murderer. Can God forgive murder? Yes. And if you remember what King David didn't do in that text, and I go, encourage you to go back and either listen to the teaching or go read Psalm 51 yourself. David didn't say, well, God, I sort of messed up. I sort of stumbled. You know, it's not that big of a deal because everybody sins and I kind of messed up. And I, he didn't use that language. You know, he said, I've sinned against you. I have sinned against you. I have done a wicked thing. And then at one point he even recognizes and says that what I've done is murder as he talks about what he did against Uriah. And look what he says here. He he pleads with God. The whole chapter does this. Pleads with God, rescue me from the guilt of what? Murder. There it is. He's like, God, rescue me. And you can see the rest of the text, but towards the back end of it, he says this, the sacrifices that God desires are a humble spirit. Oh God, a humble and repentant heart you will not reject. You know what repentance is? Repentance is turning from our sin, turning to the God who forgives our sin. Repentance is not covering up our sin and acting like it's not a big deal and saying, I really feel sorry about this and I don't wanna feel sorry about it anymore, but God, please forgive me so I feel better, then I'm gonna go do it again. That's not repentance. Repentance is saying, I wanna be done with that. Lord, with your help, I'm done with that and, and recognize and I come to you that you can fully forgive me. And God, this is cool now, God forgave David of adultery and what? Murder. Can God forgive abortion if abortion is murder? Absolutely. Were there consequences that David had to face because of this? Yes. Lingering consequences. God doesn't promise to take away the consequences for our sin on earth, right? If we've harmed somebody, the consequences of that might play out in legal action. See how that works? But we can be genuinely forgiven by God. And that is ultimately seen in what Jesus did for us. Remember we said this, that the apostle Peter talking about his king, his Lord, his master, his friend, he, he said these words. He says, he himself bore our what? Our sins on the cross. And he talked about how Jesus taking our sins on the cross, it was by his wounds that you have been healed. And he's not talking about physical healing, although God can heal physically if he chooses to. He's talking about the spiritual healing that needs to take place in every person in the room, starting with me, our sin before God. And then finally, what we did is we, we discussed now, what can we do about it, right? What difference can we make in our culture? And we're going to spend some more time talking about that today. So let's answer this question. How did we get to where we're at today when it comes to abortion? 1973, some of you were alive. I was two when this occurred. I'm still pretty old, but you know, that was a long time ago, right? 1973 and Roe v. Wade occurred. Here's how it happened. Roe v. Wade was as the Supreme Court took on a case that was coming out of Texas, where Texas was was clearly saying that they could determine right when abortions could happen and when they couldn't. And Roe v. Wade took that on from a federal standpoint to say, hey, states, you can't tell women not have an abortion is basically what happened. And a vote of seven to two voted in favor of what we call Roe v. Wade today. And because of that, there has been essentially unlimited abortion in most states. Here's a couple of things that they, that they did. This allowed for abortions up to the point of what's called viability. Now, viability is one of those, it's, a, it's like pin and jello to the wall kind of terms, you know, because viability is talking about the point that a, a baby can live on its own. Here's my question. Full term, nine month baby, you lay it out, out, out after it's come out of its mama and just let it lay there. Is it going to be okay on its own? No, it's not viable from that perspective. It still has to be taken care of outside the womb, correct? Two-year-old, how's, how's two-year-old work? Viable? No, not if not if viability means it can take care of itself outside the womb. Baby in the womb, seven months in the womb. Viable? No. But guess what? Outside the womb, same as inside the womb, it's a human being, a baby. And so this viability concept, they didn't pin down when that is and the time on that. And so again, it's like pin, pin and jello to the wall to say, what is viability? The other thing that the court did is they stipulated that the health of the mother must play a role in determining the viability of the abortion or the viability of the child and whether you could have a, a, an abortion or not. So they would determine, this is, this is so wicked, watch this. They used the phrase health of the mother, but did not define what that is. Have you, have you recognized that people can use terms that most of us think what, they, what it means, 
And then people can twist it into a pretzel and turn it into something totally different. Have you seen that happen in America? Many times, right? That's exactly what happened with this. The idea of the health of the mother became not, is this a situation where the baby is in the fallopian tube and the mother and the baby could both die? That, that health of the mother very rarely comes down to that. Health of the mother became this, watch this, is she financially healthy? Can she provide for the baby? How many people have heard somebody say, I can't have a baby, or you've heard somebody argue, well, well how can they have a baby? They're going to be born into poverty. You heard that before? Heard that before, right? How about this? How about the, the psychological health of the mother, right? The emotional health. I'm not prepared for that. Guess what? Here's newsflash. You're never prepared to have a baby. That's not how it works, right? When you get pregnant, God helps you in the prep and, and suddenly you go, we can do this and, and God helps you in the process. But this is the problem. This is the problem that, that when the Supreme Court ruled, let me tell you what they didn't find. They did not find in the Constitution, nor did they find in the Bill of Rights, anything about the right to an abortion. It's not there because our forefathers didn't write about that stuff at all. So how did they come up with that, you ask? And you guys always ask a fantastic question. They came up with this by, by focusing on the right to privacy. Now, the right to privacy, to be fair, is not clearly stipulated, but it is implied. For example, in the Fourth Amendment, it protects the right of privacy against unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. That's right. Well, not, not necessarily anymore. So the right to privacy. Here's another, Fifth Amendment. Fifth Amendment provides for the right against self-incrimination and justifies the protection of private information. And again, not so much anymore, but this is the idea. So they said, hey, women have the right to privacy, and you've heard this. A, an abortion is between a woman and her doctor. There's the idea of right to privacy. That was a really poor decision. That is the right to abortion is not found. It is not found. In our Constitution, it is not found in our early writings. And since then, sadly, the numbers from 2021, and this, much of this has to be estimated, but it is almost 63.5 million American babies have been killed via abortion in their mother's womb. We've talked about those numbers before. I've given you illustrations about how many times that would fill up Dope Campbell, how many times it would fill up the swamp. I mean, it's just crazy. I'm not going into all that today. If you want to hear more about that, you can look back at stuff we've taught on today because my goal today is really to go, well, how can we make a difference from here? What can we do? Last week, I gave you five ways we can make a difference. Again, to brief, let me give you four of those and then we'll spend some more time on the fifth. Real quickly, one, you can give towards these needs. You can give to help provide for, for mothers who are, pregnant who need help. Mothers who are pregnant many times that are unwed and they need help. We do that through a women's pregnancy center here. Our church provides, as you give to our church, our church provides $2,500 currently in our, in our budget a year towards a women's pregnancy center. Our associational churches in our Southern Baptist Association in this area, we gave through little baby bottles and putting coins in baby bottles, y'all, gave over $7,000 this past year to a women's pregnancy center. Another way you could give the Women's Pregnancy Center has, they'll have a, a banquet and a meal and you can give towards that. Tanya and I have done that personally several times. Maybe you have too. So maybe you give that way. Maybe you say, hey, I know diapers cost a lot. Let me buy a bunch of infant diapers and take them over there. They would love that. We want to challenge you to put, let's put our money where our mouth is and let's give to the needs to help provide for, for women and their babies, when, especially when they choose to keep this child. You've heard people say, well, what do y'all do about whatever? You don't do anything. We go, no, we put money to it. What do you do? We actually try to help people. We really want to help people. Second thing we've got to do is we got to serve, right? I mean, we got to serve people in general. We got to communicate care to people in general, from the oldest to the youngest, in the way that we treat them with value and care for them. But one of the things you can do to help serve a women's pregnancy center is to contact Jenny Starling. Her number's in your notes right there. If you need her number outside of that, I can get it to you. And you can help serve in that capacity. Ladies, a lot of you can help serve in that. Several of you have helped, have helped in that before. Some guys, some of us have helped before in painting and moving stuff around. We can do some stuff to help as well. The other thing that you can maybe do is you consider fostering or adopting a child. There are people in our church that have done that. Jay and Jessica Johnson are great examples of that. They have fostered and adopted ch children now. And because of that adoption, we got a, a precious little guy by the name of Ethan that runs around these parts, don't we? What a precious little guy. He, you think Ethan knows he's loved? Absolutely, right? He knows he's loved. He knows he's cared for. He's been adopted. He's been adopted. They've fostered kids before. Some of you have fostered kids before. And maybe you could say, hey, I'd be interested in helping foster. You could pray about that. 
There's a couple in our church that currently is in the process of trying to adopt because they're saying, we believe God's leading us that direction, which is really cool. So that might be a way you can help. Another way you might be able to help is to give towards fostering agencies like fosterflorida.org, for example. There are ways that you can help. The third thing we talked about is we got to vote. We got to get out there and make our vote count. When you say, well, my vote doesn't count, well, I guarantee you when it doesn't count is if you don't do it every time. And we've got to get out there and we've got to make a difference because elections have consequences. We're seeing some of them right now. And we're going to talk more about how we can impact the vote in a few, in a few minutes. And somebody could say, well, wait a second, Jackie, you're a pastor and you're at a church and you're telling people how to vote. No, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about what we can do to get something on the ballot so people can vote. And listen to me, church, we are called, we are called to live our faith out, to actually live moral. And then people say, well, you can't legislate morality, to which I'd say, using that Greek term, baloney. Baloney. Every, every law really legislates morality, doesn't it? You can't kill people because it's immoral, wrong to kill people. And so we have a law that says you can't murder, right? I mean, every law goes after that aspect of morality. Church, listen, we need to speak up as individuals, as citizens, and as followers of Jesus. The other thing we said we've got to do is we got to pray. I want to challenge you to pray like you've never prayed for the next several days. Would you pray that God moves among our nation? Would you pray that God would protect our Supreme Court justices? Do you know that there was, there was an, an attempt, an assassination attempt on Governor Kavanaugh, one of the, I'm sorry, not Governor Kavanaugh, on, on Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh, who's, who's one of our Supreme Court justices on the conservative side. Did you know that? Did you know that? You know what's not going on right now? It's, it's supposed to be against the law to petition in front of a Supreme Court judge's house. People are doing it right now. Nobody's being arrested. That's wrong. Someone needs to stand up and say it's wrong. The other thing we need to do, though, is we need to pray. Pray for the protection of our Supreme Court justices. Listen, pray that God moves among our nation, that he moves and empowers us to do what he's called us to do, that he would bring conviction to people who support the killing of babies in the mother's womb. I pray that our president would hit his knee and repent repent in Jesus' name of, of encouraging abortions. I pray that our vice president would repent of her encouragement and the garbage they speak about abortion. And you go, Jackie, that's because you're Republican. You can take whatever you take off of me. And if Trump says it or somebody else says, I'm gonna say the same stinking thing about them. We need to pray and then we need to speak out. We need to be, listen, we need to be people who are salt and light in our communities and our culture, Jesus told, told us to be. Salt and light impacts what, it, what it's around, correct? If there's darkness, there's just a little bit of light, guess what? It's gonna impact is the darkness that's around. Salt, I, I was eating last night, put a little bit of salt on something, makes it taste a whole lot better, right? Flavors things up. And we are called to be these kind of people. And so I wanna give you some ways to do just that. One of the things we've talked about before, again, I've, I've gone way more in depth on this in the past. This is, we're just a flyby on this. One of the things Christians, you and I need to do is begin to speak to people and begin to be able to ask good questions and speak relevantly with good, solid reasoning. And by the way, if somebody doesn't believe the Bible, that's a problem because if we have Bible verses, guess what they're not listening to? Bible verses. But you know what we have? Biology. Who's that belong to? The God who makes stuff, right? Who makes life. And so what we can do is we can speak of that and philosophy. Philosophy, by the way, means the love of wisdom, which Proverbs says we are to pursue the love of wisdom and wisdom, all genuine wisdom comes from God. So for example, one of the things we need to do is learn how to ask one question and keep that on the forefront of the conversation when we're talking about somebody with, about abortion. I've done this numerous times with friends of mine who are pro-abortion, and I'll ask this question. They're like, Jackie, you don't have a right because you don't have a uterus, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, that's baloney too. And I'll tell you why. And we talked about that last week. But here's, here's what I'll do. I'll go, hey, I got one question I need you to answer. Here it is. What is it? What do you mean, what is it? Well, is it just a blob of tissue? Is it just part of your body? Or is it a separate human being? Because here's the thing, I appreciate what Kokel says. He's one of my mentors and he says this. He says, if the unborn is not a human person, no justification for abortion is necessary. In other words, if you wanna get some fat sucked out of your stomach, that's part of your body. Get the fat sucked out, I don't care, right? But watch this. However, if the unborn is a human person, no justification for abortion is adequate. What is it? And what'll happen is people will throw the smoke screens and they'll go, yeah, what about molestation? And what about rape? And what about this? And what about that? And they're gonna throw smoke screens out. And what we, listen, what we have to stay on is first, let's answer this. What is it? It is a human what? Being. 
When it's born, it's not going to be a cow. It's not going to be a cat. It's not going to be a dog. It's not going to be a camel. We know what it's going to be, right? Human being at the same stage of development that you were. The second thing I want to challenge you to do is, and again, this is in your notes and you can write it down, keep it, begin to memorize this because when people start throwing these smoke screens to you, you and I need to deal with the SLED test. SLED test stands for size, level, development, environment, and degree of dependency. Good, Jackie, what's that about? People will say, well, it's just so small and it's so minute and it's so whatever because that's how we determine human value, right? It's by the size of people. Is that how we do that? Is that how we do that? The, the smallest person in here, right? We've got some, some young ones that are in here, 10 years old, some younger, right? The smallest person in here, is that person less valuable than me or you because we're bigger? No, that's silliness. Human beings are human beings, right? Size, size isn't the issue. How about this level of development? Level of development. How far along, how far along a person is. So is the, is the two-year-old, can we t- kill the two-year-old because the two-year-old is not as developed as the 12-year-old? How about killing the 12-year-old because it's not as developed as a 22-year-old? Would we do that? No, because they're the level of development they need to be at for what? A human being. Back up into the womb. Is it less human because it's seven months in the womb? Is that right? Of course not. It is absolutely human. And the level of development, again, the child's at the same level of development you were at that point. What about environment? What about environment? This past week, one of, one of the, our deacons and myself, we went to see a couple of people in some nursing home therapy centers this week. Jennifer works in one of them and others help serve as cool. And so we went to see some people this week, care for them. I really shouldn't have done that because they're not as valuable as somebody else in here that has all the freedom that we have in the environment we're in, right? Because where you're located, if you, if you have less freedom and you're currently in a, a nursing home, you're, you're less valuable than all of us. Is that how that works? Help me out. Is that how that works? Of course not. Are the people at the nursing home less valuable than you or me because the environment they're in? Of course not. They're what? Human beings. Human beings, which by the way, we might be there one day. Does that make us less valuable then? Of course not. What about degree of dependency? What about that? Is a person less valuable because they're more dependent on somebody else? Again, is the, is the infant that's 30 days old less valuable because it totally depends on parents? Absolutely not, right? This past week, some of you were able to help and we were able to do that. We'll do some more of this in the future, Lord willing. And, and we were able with some other churches, some other leaders and the help of Timmy Dyke that does a great job putting this together. We went and built a wheelchair ramp for a two-year-old. His name is Jack. Jack, some of you have seen the pictures maybe on Facebook. The way Jack is laying in his caregiver's arms right there is the way he'll be laying today and tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, unless God heals him. One day they'll probably put him in a wheelchair or something, but there's not much interaction. There's not much reaction. And that means he's not valuable, right? We just need to kill him. Is that what that means? Because he's so dependent on other people. Is that what that means? No, and let me tell you what his mama did. His mama wept on that ramp that we built. And she said, you will never know how grateful I am for what you've done for us. You know why? Because she loves Jack because she recognizes that he is what? Valuable, regardless of his degree of dependency. Isn't that right? And you and I need to, we need to be wise in how we talk with people. We need to cut through some of the smoke screens. I've given you in your notes, there, there are QR codes that you can get ready to take that picture of and watch videos on YouTube. They're all wonderful. They're good. One of them, it's got a girl from LSU that's cussing towards the end, and you'll see that. There's a guy that's being talked with. There's, there's some pastors and some leaders who are talking with people on the issue of abortion and do a great job of cutting through the smoke screens and do a great job of presenting the truth about life and what it is. And you would do well to watch other people. You know, I've learned, one, I don't know everything. Two, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can watch how other people do things well and learn to do that well as, uh, as well. So would you do that as, as well and check those, those videos out? I would encourage you to check that out. Now, what happens when Roe v. Wade gets overturned? Again, this is about the leak that occurred back in May. What happens when it gets overturned? What's gonna happen is it's gonna go back to individual states and what that state says about abortion, and that will determine when abortions can occur or if abortions can occur. And that's really where you and I come in, because sadly, the abortion numbers in Florida have been rising. You can see the numbers right there. They're rising higher and higher. There were 43 abortions by by people who live in Madison County last year. I I bet you it would have been double that if it weren't for a, a women's pregnancy center and some of you caring for people. 
heard a really cool story after the 8.30 service, a lady who works in one of our current government organizations, a lady called up to that place asking about having an abortion. And that current government place said, hey, we, we can't, uh, we, don't, we don't point people to abortions. We don't have abortions, but I'll let you talk with somebody. And there was a Christian that they passed this lady on to. And that Christian began to communicate with this lady wanting an abortion and asking a question, why do you want an abortion? And she began to care for her and walk with her. And now this lady is even able at a place where she can retire and quit her job. And her goal is to help get this lady who is now six months along in this pregnancy, who now is wanting to keep her baby. And she's helping her get a car seat and diapers and care for her. And she's her goal is this baby's when this baby's born one to walk alongside this woman and care for her. How cool is that? How cool is that? I wonder how many abortions would have occurred in, from people in Madison County, but 43, 43 last year. There are 43 little ones that could be running around right now in Madison who are not, who were killed. And sadly, most abortions take place at a, at, at a time that you might not realize. Our governor did a wonderful thing. He enacted, he signed into law a 15-week abortion ban. Anybody hear about that? A couple months ago that happened. That was cool. That was really cool. Until I found out this information, and this is not on him, he, he's trying to move the, you know, move the pendulum further and further back, and I'm grateful for that. Until I found this out, as I met on a Zoom call with some of the people we were helping for, um, for a heartbeat bill that we're going to talk about in a second, and this blew me away, and it challenged me, and it persuaded me, I need to get more serious and dig my heels in to be a part of saying we've got to protect innocent human lives. 15-week abortion ban. You know when 15-week falls? If you break it down to trimesters, what trimester does it fall to? Number two, I want you to see what we saw in Florida last year. Watch this. Last year in Florida, there were almost 80,000 abortions. Out of those 80,000, only about 5,000 took place in the second trimester when that 15-week abortion ban would kick in, which, by the way, doesn't kick in until July 1st of this year. So it's not kicked in yet. 75,000 out of 80,000 abortions happened in the first trimester. You know what the 15-week abortion ban would have done? Nothing. Do you know what's going to happen now? The 5,000, if you were to, to go back in time and, and that ban was in place for 15 weeks, I, get, I bet you money but what most people would have done instead of having it in the second trimester because they wouldn't have been able to at 15 weeks, trimester, second trimester would have gone in week 13. They would have moved it into the first trimester. In other words, that would have very little to, to no impact. I'm grateful that we moved the pendulum back, but the reality is not affecting protecting many lives. Are you with me? Does that cause anybody else in here concern? It ought to. It ought to. And what that means is, again, that many of these, many of these babies would not have been protected under the 15-week abortion ban. Here's another real concern for me. Look at this. This is a post by the Palm Beach Post on May 23rd of this year. Florida could be a haven state for those seeking abortion if Roe v. Wade falls. There's some good news, not necessarily for Florida. Here's the good news. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, and this is to the best of my knowledge, there are some things I, I might not be privy to. I've, I've done my best on this and even changed some things that are a little different from your notes. Here's the reality. Alabama and Louisiana, if Roe v. Wade falls, and it should, they will move from limiting abortion. Currently, they have a 20-week ban, which impacts probably hardly anybody. Watch this. The ban abortions altogether. In other words, they go to a pre-Roe v. Wade situation, which is where the states say you can't have abortions in, in our state, and that's where it goes if Roe v. Wade falls. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Alabama and Louisiana would say no more abortions. Texas would move from limited abortions currently have a six-week ban on, and they face a lot of pressure because of that, and they've said they're standing their ground on that, and they would move from six weeks, and they would ban abortions as well. So there's several southern states around us. You see they would ban abortions. Georgia and South Carolina will ban abortion after six weeks. So it would drop back to what they call a heartbeat bill, which I don't quite understand because heartbeat is really 21 to 22 days, which is three weeks. But six weeks is where they would fall to. Bottom line is, watch this. All the southern states surrounding us, when Roe v. Wade falls, if we stay in the current pattern that we're in, they're all going to have much more conservative, much more stringent issues regarding abortion. It's going to be harder to get one. Make sense? What's going to happen, folks, if somebody lives in Georgia and they're beyond six weeks and they want an abortion? What's going to happen? Where are they coming? Right to us. Right to Florida. Our numbers are going to skyrocket if that continues. And so unless we change things, unless the governor pushes some sort of other bill, which would be wonderful, 
but we've got a privilege that we can do something about it. Here's what we can do. We can support the Human Life Amendment. The Human Life Protection Amendment is huge. And here's, here's basically what it, not basically, here is what it says. Here's the ballot summary that would be on the ballot. All human beings have a right to life regardless of age, illness, or disability when there is a detectable heartbeat. The idea would be if, if, the, if the baby in the womb, right, has a detectable heartbeat, if the older, elderly person who's having trouble, unconscious, has a detectable heartbeat, we're not, we can't just kill them. We're not going to do that, right? And you go, Jackie, well, we ought to go back to conception. I agree. What the polls show currently, if we go back to conception and voted on that, that would get voted down in Florida. But the polls show we got a good chance if we get this on the ballot, we move that pendulum much, much further to the to the beginning of, of that life. Does that make sense? To a heartbeat bill that would occur. Now, we need almost 900,000 petitions in Florida to get to bypass our governing authorities, and this is by law, by the way, we're able to do this. So we bypass governing authorities and put this on a 2024 ballot if we have roughly 900,000 petitions. That's a big number, right? But the reality is that's only 8% of the Floridians who voted. The Floridians who voted in last year's presidential election, that's only 8% of the Floridians who vote. So we need 8% of the Floridians who voted to sign this petition. And we can do that. Now, this is very hard for you to see, but it's really smart what this, what this team has done is they put together how many votes based on per capita, how many votes we need per county to make that happen. And it's, it's very, very doable. Here's how this can be done. This can be done through local churches. It can happen at, at local events. It can, for example, and we, we're not doing this before that time, but in April typically is when we have down home days. That'd be a great day, you know, that we would be able to communicate what this is about, have people sign petitions, different things like that that we could be a part of, other people people could be a part of, pregnancy center events that occur, and local elections. The law allows for us to be a certain number of feet away at a local election, and we could we could communicate and have petitions that are there as well. Here's our task. Our task at home is very doable, very doable. Last year, we had almost 12,000 total registered voters. Voters. What we need is roughly 1,100 registered voters to sign the petition. You know what I think? I think within fellowship ourselves, because it's, we're talking registered voters over the age of 18, we probably got, I don't know, 150, you know, maybe it'll few more than that, that, that could be a part of that right there. Are there some other churches in our community that if they knew about this, they'd probably, they'd probably help with that? Yeah, I think among the churches ourselves, we ought to be ra- able to raise 1,100 petitions. And beyond that, what if we raised more that would go over the number in case other, other uh, counties didn't meet the number that they needed to meet? And so we can, we can do this. We can do this, but we got to get on it. And we're going to need some help. So one of the things we're going to need is, is they've done something really wise. They'd like to have some county captains that would be in charge of this going on on different counties so that they could communicate with leaders and church leaders and others and make sure that there are teams put together that can help get petitions out so that we can sign petitions and make this get on the 2024 ballot. Again, you go, Jackie, you've, that seems really political. Watch this. What is the goal of this? To save who? Unborn who? Human beings. Unborn human beings. Is that worth our time and effort? So Jackie, the Bible doesn't say anything. Yeah, it says a lot. Let me give you an example, and we'll finish this part up, and then we'll have some time together in communion. Look what Proverbs 24 says. Rescue those being taken off to death and save those stumbling towards slaughter. Writer of Proverbs says, and if you say, but we didn't know about this, won't he who weighs hearts consider it? Won't he who protects your life know Won't he repay a person according to his work? Who is he who repays a person according to his work, y'all? God, if we know what's going on and we do nothing, who's going to hold us accountable for that? If we know what's going on and we do nothing, who's going to hold us accountable? God of the universe. Does this matter? Is this something Christians ought to be involved in? You know, Christians from the very beginning very beginning of our faith in Jesus, the very beginning, early Christians, you know what they did? Did you know that, that early Christians had to deal with some people who actually had abortions in their day? Some of those were chemical abortions. Did you know that? 
if they ate certain something, drank certain something, they could lead to abortion. There are old wives' tales that people could do certain things and the baby would be aborted in the womb as well. So there were people doing that. There were also sometimes surgical procedures. How wicked must that have been in their day? As they had less technology than we have in our day, and it's still super wicked in our day. And then watch this. You know what many Christians would do? Many non-Christians, what they do is, is they would just leave their baby out just to die. They'd let the baby be born, and they would just leave it out to die. Many times they'd leave females out, not males out, because females, from their perspective, might be considered less valuable than some in the Roman Empire. They'd leave babies out to die. Christians would come up on a baby that was crying and, and was in the process of dying. What would they do? They'd leave it, right? Because it's not their business. Now, what would they do? They'd take that baby, and they would find somebody to help provide for that baby, and they'd grow that baby up, provide for that baby, and then they'd share the gospel with that, that baby as that little one grew up, right? Hey, Christians, we got we to gotta make a difference. Christians have always tried to make a difference, and they didn't have the privilege that we have, and that is to try to impact our governing leaders to point to the truth. And here's, here's the rest. This is, this is big. That taken off to death, you might go, Jack, he's not talking about abortion particularly. No, he's not. He's talking about people that were, that were being slaughtered, people who were being manipulated and, and poorly treated, and, treated and, and others knew about it and could have stepped in and done something and didn't. Do you think that applies to abortion? I think it applies to other people who are doing wicked things? I think so. And let me encourage you in this way. Let me show you what Paul says in Romans 10, two passages, and we'll be done. Look at this. We have the great privilege, Christian, to be the hands and feet and voice and ears and to take the message of Jesus to others and to communicate with, with women who want to have abortions that they matter and so do their babies, to communicate with women and men who have participated in abortions and communicate with them that, yes, they have sinned against God, but they haven't gone too far from for his grace if they will turn from their sin and trust him, which is the same message that we received, right? when we came to Jesus. Look what Paul says. And how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've not heard about him? Watch this. Or how can they hear about him unless someone, what? Tells them. Aren't you grateful somebody told you about Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers to you? What if they hadn't told you? He goes on to say this. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? And this is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. I hope every person in here, you'll have beautiful feet. I'm not talking about stuff attached to your ankles. I'm talking about the reality that you are the messenger who brings the grace and the good news of Jesus to others. That confronts people with the reality of their sin because nobody, including you in this room, is, is going to be okay with God going, well, I didn't know, and it wasn't that big of a deal, and after all, everybody sins, and you know the big man upstairs, that ain't going to fly. You know what's going to fly? Here's what Paul says just before this same part of the passage. Look what he says here in Romans 10. Some of you know it so well. If you openly declare that Jesus is, help me, Lord. Other translations say confess he's Lord. It's the same concept. That you're confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That means he is boss over your life. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might be saved. Is that what it says? It says you could be saved. 50-50 shot, flip a coin, we'll find out when we get there. Is that what it says? No, it says you what? You will be saved. You know what that is? That's a promise that God gives. So how, how is one saved from their sin, which every person in here needs to be saved from our sin? We've sinned against the holy God. How are we saved? Watch this. We confess, we declare Jesus as Lord over our lives. We turn from our sin and we turn to the one who went to the cross for us. We believe he rose from the dead because it doesn't matter if you follow a Lord who's laying in a grave somewhere. I've been to Israel once, Lord willing, going in February again, and I'll go to two different spots where we look at and say, that could be where he's buried. Guess what? We don't know because guess what? He ain't there. And three days later, he wasn't there either. Three days later, because he rose from the dead, we serve a risen Savior. And if you'll confess him as king and you will, you will follow him, you can be saved. Look what he goes on to say. He says this. He says, for it's by believing with your heart that you're made right with God and openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Here's another passage he quotes from the Old Testament. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you think you've gone too far, I got great news for you. You haven't. If you're still breathing, there's still hope. And so there would be two extremes that really need to hear what I'm fixing to say and I'll be done. One extreme would be this, Jackie, I'm a pretty good person and God's gonna let me in because I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you're a good person, please explain to me why Jesus died on the cross. 
If you could be good enough, you tell me how, how you get in. And according to Jesus, he says, that's not how it works. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, who? No one. Who's no one include? You and me. Just turn and say, no one includes you. Tell them it feels good. No one includes you. That feels good. Didn't it say it? Yeah, no one includes you. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus taught, right? So one extreme is to say, I'm good enough. I'm, God's going to understand me and the big man got a deal cut. No, no, no. Uh-uh. And the other extreme would be say, Jackie, I've gone so far. God can't forgive me for everything I've done. There was a guy on the cross that felt that way, and he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, too late for you, right? No, Jesus said, Jesus said to him, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He forgave him. Listen, you haven't gone too far for God's grace. And somebody in the room right today or somebody that's watching today, if you say, Jackie, I really have, no, you have not. And maybe you've been saying, God, show me, God, tell me, and God's speaking to you today through the authority of the scriptures to go turn from your sin and turn to him. Ask Jesus to be king over your life. Turn from your sin. He will forgive you and he'll change your life. And then, listen to me, we get to have the privilege to go tell other people one beggar telling the other beggar where to find the bread of life. Jesus has forgiven me much, and he can forgive you too. That's our great hope. Lord, I thank you for the truth of Scripture. I also thank you for the truth of what that you've given us in nature through what we learn and study in life, biology, and such. And I thank you for every person in here that was formed in their mother's womb. And I'm thankful that, that they... Uh, that they're alive. And I pray that you use us to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. That's what we would pray today. Lord, you know every need of every person. And I pray that you would deal with each person here. And I trust you have been at a heart level, that Christians would stand up for what's right and what's true. And that we would also be used to, to communicate with good reasoning to others and uh, communicate the truth of, of who you are and what you said and the reality of what you've made and in people created in, the, in your image. And Lord, I, I thank you so much for forgiving us so much. And my prayer would be that if there's somebody here today who doesn't know your forgiveness, that they would know your forgiveness. And I ask that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.